So today we're going to talk about some super food tips, not superfoods. I don't even know what superfoods are. They, I think they, I think it's kind of the new trendy, uh, marketing thing because I went and tried to find a definition of what a superfood is. And of course you can find all kinds of stuff on the internet. So these are super food tips. Okay. So diet is probably one of the most important aspects of managing or transforming multiple sclerosis naturally. Um, so when we think about it in the word, words of Colin Campbell, it's probably one of the most intimate things that happens with our body. So it's where what we consume actually becomes a part of ourselves, right? So it, it can build or break the microbiome. It directs your genetic material. Uh, it either ramps up a misdirected immune system or calms it down. It provides vital nutrients. It promotes detoxification on macro levels as well as micro, uh, levels. And it's just ultimately important self-care, self-love and self-compassion and probably the most self-loving, self-caring, self-compassionate thing someone with multiple sclerosis can do. And you know that I'm not hardcore on any one diet because in 20 years of working with people who have MS, I've never found that to be effective to say, okay, everybody do this because everybody's not the same and everybody doesn't have the same, uh, the same nutritional needs. But, um, there's, a whole other aspect to nutrition and, and, and MS. And that is whole, the whole psychology of eating. And that, that is probably the biggest variable in doing something for yourself, something that is a diet just for you. Right. So, um, we've been brainwashed basically by relentless marketing that crap food is good food. Um, food has been used as a reward or alternatively has been withheld as punishment. You know, you go to your room without your dinner. If they still do, do they still do that anymore, Mike? I don't know, but they did when we were kids. And one of the most destructive uh, aspects of food is definitely food addiction and specifically carb addiction and carb and sugar. And honestly, it's no different than, you know, Coke or booze, you know, it's it, the same things going on in the brain and it's the same struggle to get over it. Right. So all that to say that, you know, creating your ideal MS diet is a moving target and it, it requires constant care and constant upgrading and, you know, sometimes you're on the wagon, sometimes you're off the wagon. Hopefully you're on the wagon, uh, more than off as you know, an old farm girl, I can tell you falling off the wagon usually hurts and, uh, metaphorically as well as physically. And I think there are many of us that can already attest to that. Right. But no matter where you are today, if you are here listening to me talk for the first time, or if you're been listening to me talk for years as some of you have been, you know that, or maybe you don't know, I'm telling you <laughs> that all you want to do is bring more nutrition in and it can, it can be a split second, um, decision right in the very moment before you load your fork up, you can redirect that decision to bringing something more, something more nutritious in. And so that's what I want to talk about when I talk about super foods. Okay. So, um, I'm going to start these in no apparent order. These are just how they came to me. And, um, and you will probably have your own to add. So I hope you do that. So my first uh, the first super food that I would like to talk about is hemp hearts. And it always surprises me how many people don't know uh, about hemp hearts because they've just been part of my diet for so many years, but hemp hearts 
and um, pepitas, what are called pepitas. And those are the little green uh, pumpkin seeds. So those are both powerhouses of protein, of good fat, of fiber, and you can add them to just about anything. They are like perfect proteins, like one tablespoon of hemp hearts, for example, is five grams of complete protein. So you can add that to anything. You know, you can add that to salads. You can add that to soups. If you're still doing oatmeal, which we'll soon talk you out of, you can add it there just to make it better, right? As you're moving away from those grains. But those things are so, uh, so easy to add to anything. And, you know, um, we make a, what's called a salad topper and it's just, it's just a mason jar. And I put, um, hemp hearts. I put pepitas. We put cranberries, maybe sesame seeds. Like it's, uh, both at Costco. Thanks, Lachelle. <laughs> you can get the salad toppers at Costco now, apparently, but I want you to know that I actually invented those. <laughs> Just joking. I thought I did until I saw them at Costco, right? So you can even mix, you know, you can add hemp harps even to your, um, your chia pudding in the morning. So you can literally put them anywhere. So that's my first superfood. My, my second superfood tip is to eat a rainbow. And the more colors you eat, the more phytonutrients you are uh, consuming. So phytonutrients are, phyto means plant, nutrients means nutrients, right? Every color, so we've got red foods, we've got purple foods, we've got green foods, we've got white foods, and we've got the yellow slash orange food. And each of them has a different specialized phytonutrients. And you've probably heard some of them like carotenoids, uh, anthocyanins, flavonoids, polyphenols, lutein, and uh, uh, zeaxanthin, allicin. All of those are different things that they all have great anti-inflammatory, antioxidant qualities. And the more the more color you can put on your plate, the better. I actually like to think of his dinner, a dinner plate as a painter's palette, right? So I, I'm a very visual person. And when I'm planning a meal, I'll think, okay, I've got a piece of salmon. So that's orange. So I'll put some cauliflower from the white family in it, and maybe some beets from the red slash purple family, and always something green. So always think of your green first and then fill in the blanks. Um, uh, broccoli, I'm going to pull that out as a next superfood. Uh, broccoli has really been in the limelight, I would say, for the last 10 years or so as an extraordinary brain food. And, and you know, when you think of it, l look at a, a head of broccoli and it could, if you looked closely enough, almost look like, um, a brain, right? So broccoli, once again, super antioxidant, lots of nutrients in that with an affinity for the brain. So that green in this house, how many times a week do we eat broccoli? Many, many, like sometimes three or four times a week. We'll eat broccoli. Cooking by color. Cooking by color, Mike says, right? So my next, um, my next uh, superfood tip is having always having fresh chopped herbs on hand. And, you know, I got this idea. We have friends that own a beautiful restaurant in Burlington and it's got like an open kitchen. And then there are actually three booths that sit in front of the kitchen. That used to be my favorite um, was sitting in that booth right in front of the chef. And I was that cheeky person that always asked questions. So I would see him, you know, with one of those little white bowls, you know, always putting this green stuff on everything. He was just sprinkling it on everything. And so I asked him one day, I said, what is that? And he told me all about it. It was a combination of parsley, chives, and oregano chopped up really fine. He would make a mess of it at the beginning of the week, stick it in the freezer get a fresh bowl out, one bowl at a time. And he really literally put it in everything. 
So I totally stole that idea and I encourage you to steal that idea too because it's a great combo. Another simple combo that we have been using this week because we had an overload of cilantro is cilantro and green onion. And, and that is another sort of, um, you know, combination that you can use anywhere. It's got a little bit more of an Asian flair with the cilantro and the green onion, but you can do the same, same thing with it. You can buy a head of cilantro and, and a bunch of green onions and chop them all up and, and throw them in the freezer and then use them as you feel like using them. So chopped fresh herbs, what are you doing? You're adding green, right? From the, from the color palette. And also herbs have, have their own unique, um, uh, healing properties, right? So cilantro, for example, is a massive mercury detoxification. So, you know, some people make cilantro pesto and eat and take a teaspoon a day as a treatment for, you know, a mercury de uh, as a mercury detox. And while we're on the theme of pesto, that's another great herb combination. You can get a vegan pesto that is actually, um, doesn't have any Parmesan cheese in it, but is super yummy sorus. And you can toss steamed vegetables in it. You can have all kinds of fun with pesto. Um, my next, um, most super food thing is roasted vegetables. You know, that's another thing you can batch cook them. And, uh, Oh, Caroline is saying she puts cilantro in her smoothie. So good. Yum. I do that sometimes too. And it almost, yeah, it has a really unique flavor, almost like an orange flavor. I really like it. Um, sorry, it got distracted. So we were talking about roasted vegetables. Um, I just think it's a great way once again to batch cook, right? You can make a, a huge cookie sheet or even two cookie sheets full of roasted vegetables. And, um, and then you can eat them that night. You can eat them for breakfast the next morning. You can, you know, you can have for dinner the next night. Um, if you're a vegetarian, you can add a couple of tablespoons of hemp hearts and pumpkin seeds and a little bit more oil. And, um, you've got like a delicious meal, right? So the roasted vegetables and, oh, I wrote down some of my favorite combos here for you. Uh, my, uh, one of my favorite combos is cauliflower mushrooms and leeks. I know sounds weird, but super delicious and Brussels sprouts, carrots, onions, and parsnips. That's another one of my favorites. And here's another little tip. You know how I am on about soups all the time. Those, uh, soup, uh, those rust roasted vegetables make a mean soup. So Put those roasted vegetables in your Vitamix, add a broth, a beef broth or a vegetable broth, depending what you want, and just puree it down to a thickness that's to your taste. And it makes great soup. So you can even do one cookie sheet of roasted veggies for you to eat right away. And one that can turn into um, some pureed soup that ends up being three or four jars of soup in the freezer. So I'm all about having something on hand. We call it emergency food, you know, for those days where nobody feels like cooking uh, or you get home late and you're stupid hungry. Um, that's, you know, that's when soup is so good on hand. And remember, you take that soup, you add a couple tablespoons of hemp hearts or pepitas to it, and it's yummy saurus, right? Okay, um, my next superfood and this would probably be a bit of a discussion is, um, fish and fish is a great digestible protein. It's fairly neutral across all the blood type groups. So there's, there's some fish for everyone. It's, uh, if you're eating the right fish, you're getting lots of omega-3 oils and, um, I know there are a lot of concerns now about plastics in fish. Yes, plastics and from the oceans, right? All those masses of plastics that are floating around the ocean breaking down are actually making their way into our fish's tissues. And then the other one, of course, is the longstanding um, concern about mercury. So it doesn't mean you don't eat fish. 
Uh, if we didn't eat based on the way we're destroying the earth, then we wouldn't be eating anything because there's pesticides all over vegetables and fruits and, you know, our animals are full of whatever. Uh, so let's just figure out how to make the best fish choices. So, you know, wild is always a good place to start. So if you're talking wild, you can think of sockeye salmon. So Pacific salmon, you can think of cod, you can think of halibut. Um, you can think of the smaller fish, which are even more omega-3 dense, like anchovies, like uh, mackerel, um, spe uh, spelt, smelt, smelt. I used to go smelt fishing with my dad. Um, the oh, herring there's some other ones I'm just I just made some notes here and then think about lower on the food chain okay so the lower on the food chain um the the lower the contamination so the higher on the food chain so if you've got a shark um that's probably the worst meat you can eat because it's eating all kinds of stuff to get there and that's, you know, bioaccumulation of toxins just makes it like a worst case scenario. Of course, tuna has been infamous for its, uh, for its um, mercury content. But uh, stay to the wild. The smaller fish are great. Um, uh, what, are, what are the little fish that I like in the can? What are, oh... You know, why can't I think of it? No, oh, the mackerel we get too in the can. No, sardines. Yeah, sardines are great. And those are, you know, good protein, good fat, good snacks, right? Good snacks. Um, other good fish are trout, whitefish, sole, uh, good shrimp, good scallops, uh, good clams. So by good, I mean wild, not farmed, right? And oh, by the way, uh, Atlantic salmon is 99% farmed, okay? So you don't want to be eating Atlantic salmon. Um, I know Costco a couple of times a year has the wild sockeye salmon come in and we just go in and, and buy sides of it and cut it up and freeze it. So we have it until the next time. So fish, good, ew. <laughs> oh, brother. Okay, Christopher. No, no sardines for you. You get down to Digby for some of those scallops. Um, so, oh, homemade soup is actually the next one on my list. And I, I, I feel like I talk about homemade soup all the time, but I really do think it is a super food because it's like, it's like a meal in a cup or in a bowl. Like you can get so much into a soup. It's not even funny. And I just want to remind you how I make my bone broth because I think it's a pretty awesome way. So it's the bones, of course. And then I throw what onions uh, and celery for sure, for sure. And anything that's sort of rotting in the bottom of my vegetable drawer goes in that soup pot. But then I also add seaweed. So you're getting the minerals from the sea. You're getting the, um, the iodine, you know, for the thyroid, these things that are inherently missing in our, in our soils and that are farmed. Um, and, uh, what about, what else do I put in there? I put the, ba -ba 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 -ba. oh, reishi mushrooms, dried reishi mushrooms. That's what I forgot to mention the last time I talked about bone broth. And of course, you know, there's all kinds of studies about reishi mushrooms and immune modulation. So um, Sue uh, reminded me that she does her bone broth until you can like fly a flag in it. And that's ultimately the greatest way to do it. But like, I'll bring it to a boil and simmer it for anywhere between two hours and two days. And um, it's always delicious. Then you just strain it off and you can put that just straight in the freezer and make soup at a different time. You can just drink that, drink a cup of it a day or a cup or two cups a day. If you've got, uh, you know, a microbiome that needs some loving, drink some of that um, every day until the pot's gone uh, or just freeze it as bone broth and take it out later. I mean, <laughs> you know, I've seen the tubs of bone broth in the health food store. They're 10 bucks 
for a thing of bone broth, good grief. You can make a lot of uh, bone broth um, with like a bag of, of grass-fed beef or chicken bones. Straight from the farm. Straight from the farmer, yeah. yeah. And if you don't have that connection, go find it. Go make it, right? Because it's important that we know where our food comes from. And uh, I'm so happy when we moved out here. The first thing I do is Google pasture-raised meats. And um, and I've done that now that we're heading off to Nova Scotia in the fall. I've already, I'm already set up in Nova Scotia. I've got my pasture-raised farmers all lined up. So... Uh, it's another thing that when we were talking about superfoods, the, the difference between meat that is raised uh, on the pasture or on grains is, inflama is the infl inflammatory content. So grains are omega-6 intense. Omega-6 oils are inflammatory oils. So if you're feeding your animals in grains, then you're getting more of an inflammatory meat. This is where, you know, the, like even Roy Swank's work was done on commercial meat. That was grass, not grass fed. That was grain fed, right? But nowadays, like any, nowadays, like any time we've got to, um, we've got to worry about marketing, right? So what I've found in the last year is that People are advertising grass-fed or pasture, pasture, pastured, and you have to ask if they're grass-fed and grass-finished because, and I know we did this on the farm at home, is you raise the beef out on the field and with hay, so grass-fed, right? But then six weeks before they went to market, you loaded up the grains so you could fatten them up to take them to market. And that totally changes the fat profile of the meat. So you're, you're into a more omega-6 pro-inflammatory meat. And what we know, even with beef that are truly pastured, uh, grass-fed and grass-finished, that meat has a much more intensely omega-3 um, fat profile, besides the fact that it tastes absolutely delicious too. So, um, I am off, off on a tangent, but, um, that all of that came from bone broth. <laughs> okay. My next superfood that I wanted to talk about is green or white tea and specifically, um, the, the, uh, constituents that are part of uh, green and white tea. But first of all, I want you to know that green and white tea, even though there's 30 milligrams of caffeine in it, it still counts as, as part of your water count for the day. So coffee, by contrast, has about 100 milligrams of caffeine in it, and coffee is considered a diuretic. So one cup of coffee equals negative two cups of water, one cup of green tea equals one cup of fluid, right? So uh, you're not taking, you're actually adding to your water count. Um, and that 30 milligrams of caffeine that's in a cup of green tea is often enough to help people wean off um, coffee because some people just, they go into withdrawal when they just stop coffee, cold turkey. So they need a little something to get them over the hump and a cup of green tea will often do that. So there are two important constituents in green tea that I want to talk to you about. Both of them are important uh, for people who have MS. And by the way, both of them are well studied in MS. Like there's, once again, go over to, to Google, uh, Google Scholar and just, if you're curious about if there's been any research done on anything, just go, you know, green tea and multiple sclerosis or EGCG, which is one of the constituents where there's been a lot of um, research and find these things out. It's kind of interesting. I mean, you're going to get scientific papers, but that's, that seems to be what everybody wants nowadays. And they're there, you know, they're absolutely there. So two constituents, I said, one of them is L-theanine and I just love L-theanine. L-theanine has this super calming effect on them. So alert, but calm, you know, um, it reduces stress. It boosts your mood, lots of research on it. Um, 
the L-theanine with the small amount of caffeine that's in green tea as having positive outcomes on brain function. Um, so memory, attention, anxiety, all of that is improved with L-theanine. And, and both of these things can be purchased as a supplement. Uh, you know, don't, you know me, I don't want you taking a million supplements unless you know exactly why you're taking them. But if you're anxious and stressful, L-theanine is definitely a good one. The other one is called EGCG, and it's a great big long name. I'm not even going to bother with it. But it's a powerful antioxidant whose, claims, whose claim to fame is reducing stress and inflammation, and it actually uh, improves brain cell function. So it improves energy metabolism, both resting and... Um, active and it regulates the immune function. So there's a lot of immunoregulatory stuff you'll come across if you do choose to look at it. And there are lots and lots of MS specific studies on that. So how much green tea would you drink? Well, I drink it by the gallon in my Snoopy mug. Um, but you know, the, the therapeutic dose to prevent cancer is 10 cups a day. That's a lot of green tea. Um, I think it's easy to get two or three cups in a day. And uh, if not more, I know I get more in, but um, <laughs> that's me. Okay, so that's that's green and white tea. And in just in case you're interested, it's all the same plant, right? Black tea, green tea, white tea. It's just processed differently. So the black tea that we know, it's got more caffeine in it because the caffeine concentrates. It's oxidized. So that's what happens with that. That's how it becomes black tea. Green tea leaves, the, the leaves are picked and they're steamed. So they're not oxidized. They're not processed in any way. They're, they're just steamed. And the white tea, white tea has only been available in the West. I don't know. Actually, I don't know. But in my adult life, it was the first time I saw white tea. And white tea used to be the, the tea that the emperors would drink. They would pick the, the tea, the white tea for the emperor. So it was the new, the brand new leaves. Um, and I believe they're just dried. I'm, I, I did not prepare that information for you, but they're not oxidized as well. So there's white tea, then there's green tea, then there's black tea. Okay. Of course, blueberries hits everybody's superfood list, right? Blueberries are just little, little magic blue pellets from heaven, honestly. They're probiotic or prebiotic foods, rather. They're fiber, they're vitamin C, they're all kinds of nutrients, all of the, all of the properties and the, the phytonutrients that that blue slash purple food group has. Blueberries, you can do anything with them too. You can just, you can have them just, you can just eat them the way they are. You can add some coconut milk to them and make them into a dessert. You can mash them and put them in your chia pudding. You know, you can do anything with blueberries. I'm sure I don't need to sh tell you how to eat blueberries. But I'm, we, we all do that lovingly and wonderfully. So those are a few of my sort of, you know, superfood and superfood tips. So there, I realize they're not all superfoods, but, you know, the hemp hearts, the eating the rainbow, the broccoli, the chopped herbs, the roasted veggies the fish, the homemade soup, the green and white tea, and the blueberries. So now I just wanted to talk about a few food flops as far as I'm concerned. And the first one is gluten-free garbage. And by gluten-free garbage, I mean any most most gluten-free breads qualify as gluten-free garbage because they're made with potato starch and tapioca starch and rice flour and carbs, 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 carbs. There's no nutritional value in that. In fact, those are what we call anti-nutrients because they extract more from your system than, than they add. And oh, by the way, 
eating all that stuff is also dehydrating. You know, think about it. You're eating all those starches and like potato starch. Seriously, what could be more inflammatory than that? Well, I'm sure I could find 10 things that were, but be careful when you start your gluten-free journey because it, we live in a marketing world. It is, um, it, they make them taste so good and so irresistible. Their job is to make them taste like, oh, I can't believe it's not, it's gluten-free, you know? Well, I find that it, sure, it's nice to have a, a piece of toast every once in a while. I, I default to the keto world for that because you know, those folks don't want any carbs in their food, right? So, uh, there's the, these keto buns, and keto breads, the rest recipes for them are all, all over the internet. They're very, very simple to make and they're really quite delicious. And mm -hmm. um, they're incredibly high fiber, super low carb, and they give you that vessel that you need to put your whatever on, right? Your guacamole or your hummus or your, dare I say, peanut butter or better, better yet, almond butter. But sometimes you just want a slice of something to put something on and you want to be careful because you don't want to get into those gluten-free things that jack your carb count up. Another pet peeve of mine is dairy-free cheese because I, I actually read the label on a brand that's very popular called Daya, D-A-I-Y-A. And I, I actually went and looked for it so I could tell you exactly what's in there. So this is something that you're eating, thinking that you're getting cheese, filtered water. Okay, good. Tapioca flour. So hundred percent starch, expeller pressed non-GMO canola oil and or safflower oil. So both lousy oils, coconut oil, whatever, pea protein. Okay. Um, salt, vegan, natural flavors, whatever that is, inactive yeast, vegetable glycerin, xanthan gum, citric acid, and titanium dioxide. And you melt that and eat it. You know, I can't help but thinking about cheese and anything that sort of behaves like cheese. Like I look at food and I think, how's that going to behave in my body? And when I see stretchy, gooey cheese, well, sure, maybe it looks delicious, but then you think about that goes into your system and that stretchy gooey mess has to be digested somehow. And it's generally poorly digested. So if you're looking for an alternative to cheese, stick to the, um, the cashew cheeses, I suppose, if you must, um, and, uh, or just learn some strategies to live without it. Right. And, so that's one of my, those, those are two of my food flops there, the gluten, gluten-free garbage and dairy-free cheese. The next one, uh, that I, I see very frequently, uh, is people who swear by a keto diet, but they had their gallbladder removed 15 years ago. That my friends is a recipe for disaster. So, if you've got no gallbladder, your gallbladder is what you need to process fat. So if you're eating a diet that is 75% fat, my Lord, you better have a gallbladder or you better be eating a ton of digestive enzymes. So that's another food flop is keto diet, no gallbladder. Um, and then my last weekend, uh, uh, food flop or super flop that I'm going to share with you is the whole concept of the weekend warrior. And these are the people, and I've met hundreds of them over the last 20 years. And they say, oh, my diet is perfect from Monday to Friday. I have my smoothie and I have steamed vegetables and I have salad and I have lean protein. And I have this and I have that. But on the weekends, no man, they're mine, you know? And yeah, my husband and I, have, you know, Saturday is pizza night and they, just kind of blow the wad on the weekend and it's, oh my God. And then they come to me and say, I just, I'm just not getting better. And it's like, yeah, you're not getting better because you're blowing everything that you've done all week on the weekends. So 
there's that whole concept of cheating. I hate the word cheating because really the only person you're cheating is yourself, right? And I just lovingly and gently bring you back to that making that best decision in the moment. And you can redirect, you can have that fork right up to your lips and redirect that decision. So don't beat yourself up. Just know that with the very next bite, you can get back on the wagon. Okay. So do we have some, some questions? Do some you see them questions? On the screen okay. I so, do see them and I see everybody's name too. You're going to say that the battle with the Oreos is won at the supermarket, not in the That's in the right. Country. So I don't know if you heard that. Mike says the battle with the Oreos is one at the supermarket, not at the pantry. And you know what? We Every once in a while, we lose our mind. When was the last time we threw stuff out? Uh, oh, I know. We went to this super popular uh, gluten-free bakery. That's out where we live here now. We spent $90 at this gluten-free bakery. And we had the most amazing carrot cake cupcakes I've ever had in my entire life. So we ate those deliciously. And then we got home and we looked at, I started looking at the labels. I wish I had done that before I donated $90. And we have a garbage chute because we live in a, a building now and I just marched it all right over to the garbage chute. You know, you have that weak moment where you're there and everything looks so good and march because you're hungry. Because you're hungry yeah. <laughs> and then we marched it off. To the garbage dump. Okay, so Langelle is saying this presentation from beginning to end, amen. Okay, very <laughs> good. Thank you, Langelle. Uh, Chris it, Fader is asking uh, thyroid issues. So is seaweed still a good idea? Oh, I can click on that. Oh, yes, there's my, there's, there we go. So Chris Fader is asking thyroid issue. So is seaweed still a good idea? Well, if you've got a thyroid issue, it needs to be monitored, of course. But the general thought is that the iodine that, and other minerals that you get from seaweed is definitely uh, has a positive benefit on the thyroid. And once again, our, far, our soil is deficient of so many minerals now that we definitely need to be eating them from good places. Christopher Mussels. Yes, sir. Hi, Angie. Yeah. Okay. You get your mussels. No sardines. Um, Christopher says, difficult to get good fish in my neck of the woods. Oh. Nah, never mind. Langelle Parsley. I'm, I'm trusting that's a shopping list that you're making. I think that was an answer to somebody who didn't like your cilantro idea. Oh, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. So, and you know what? Do you know that there's actually a gene for parsley? Uh, for cilantro um, despising, it's true. It's true. There's people I find, how do I get rid of Chris there? Okay. Not that I want to get rid of Chris. I love Chris. Um, but you know, people either love cilantro or it tastes like soap and that's actually a genetic snip. So yeah, just use any herbs, you know, whatever. We just, we just plant pots and pots of herbs. I always have rosemary out in, in my pots, um, always have parsley and yeah, when, when, when I make a pot of soup, I literally go out to my balcony. Well, not right now where it's minus whatever. And I just take hands full of, of herbs. There's no recipe, throw them in the pot, right? Can we do a quick survey of the people that are out there? Where do you rate yourself uh, now that you know what an optimum diet is? And we're talking seven days a week. Where are you on a scale of one to 10? There you go. On a scale of one to 10, how close to, are you to an optimal diet? Um, Orsley, what, Langelle, I have no idea what, oh, parsley. I'm <laughs> sorry. Okay, got it. I'm reading the list backwards. Got it. So Langelle is saying parsley instead of a cilantro, of course. And Christopher is also saying roast veggies in air fryer every morning helps remove sugar cravings. Nice. I, and you know, I think that breakfast is like completely, completely trashed by the Western 
uh, by the Western diet. You know, I think that the biggest problem with breakfast is that we think of it as different from any other meal of the day. So I love roast veggies, lean protein, leftover chicken from the night before, a bowl of soup. To me, these are the best breakfasts. And as soon as you let go of the ego fantasy, you can get into better breakfast meals, right? Okay. And okay. Yes, we've got some cilantro haters and some cilantro lovers in the group, eh? That's so, so, so typical. Uh, <laughs> okay. Renee says six. <laughs> it, six. Oh, shamefully six. Well, you know, and no shame, right? Christopher, no shame. Everybody, no shame. We don't need shame. We, we, our culture does shame like to the max. We just need to say, you know, at six out of 10, you're probably six out of 10 better than your neighbor. You know, Tracy is, is copying to a four out of 10. There's people we know, relatives, that yeah. say they're a nine. You look in their fridge. Yeah, it's just, just shameful. Yeah, so it's shameful. There, I just said no, no <laughs> shame, right? Uh, Cariad, six, six out of 10 too. Uh, yeah, but do all your suggestions. Good, good, good. Was a 10 out of 10, currently six. Heading back to 10 this week. Yes, Langelle. Lori, about a seven out of 10. Awesome. So you know what? Remember, wherever you are right now is perfect and you can take a step forward with that very next bite. Um, Cariad uh, is talking about a, a crock pot, a veggie soup every 14 days. Crock pots are fabulous tools for doing that batch, that batch cooking. And I really, especially if you're having energy issues right now, batch cooking is where it's at. Like get your best friend, get your husband or wife or whatever, and get in the kitchen on a Sunday and say, okay, this is what we're going to make and get her done, so to speak. Right. Excellent. Well, I thank you all again for a wonderful evening. I hope that was helpful. I had my little list of topics that we were, that I was talking about. I haven't decided which one we're going to talk about next week, but I will let you know as soon as I do. Okay. Thank you for hanging with me tonight. Maggie here is saying I'm a cross between a keto Mediterranean and feel like I'm a fish. <laughs> oh, eight ish. Sorry. I read fish eight ish. Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and actually, Maggie, keto and Mediterranean makes a nice cross, right? Uh, since I started this journey, I've been better uh, since the last five years. Excellent, Lori. Awesome. Okay, folks. Bonsoir. Raise we will that bar. raise that bar, and we will see you uh, here on uh, YouTube again next week. And let me know if you found this link easier to find than I know a lot of people were struggling to find the link on uh, the Facebook link. And yeah, like I said, Facebook was just making things darn difficult. Okay. Have a good night. Take care. Bye-bye.